All right, well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, good morning to you all fine people. Let's see here. Okay. Oh, make sure we're, make sure our recording is going. Yep, it's going. All right, good, good, good. All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to session five of our 10 week trauma informed trauma responsive wraparound training. Let's go ahead and pull that screen up. Shrink this down. Adopt your stress, trauma, and behavior, a 10 week virtual trauma responsive wraparound training for providers and parents with myself, Brian Post, your host with the most. The goal of this training, number one, to raise the collective consciousness of human behavior and to provide a new language in which to define and explain it. Remember, as we learn this information, as we implement this information, integrate this information, just got a text this morning from, from one of our beautiful parents who just had a breakthrough with her daughter based on last, last session. We want to we want to incorporate a language, a new language. With every new level of consciousness comes a new language. So we want to incorporate this new language. This training is specific to adoptive parents and adoption wraparound providers. So it's today's session five, trauma and the brain. So yesterday, last last uh, session, I was, got, got a little spiritual on you guys, got a little philosophical. And uh, today I'm going to try to to go right into this content and really, really focus on it in a cognitive way. And then we'll integrate that emotional understanding that we need to have when it comes to this material and working with our children. So let's just jump right into this. Trauma is defined as any stressful event which is prolonged, overwhelming, or unpredictable. Any stressful event, which is prolonged, overwhelming, and unpredictable. We talked about that last week, and I just just popped in my head. It just popped in my head something that I actually wanted to incorporate from a past training into into this into this um, presentation. Okay, so I added that slide. Let's get back to that real quick. So we talked about this last week. Um, in our last session, that trauma is any stressful event, which is prolonged, overwhelming and unpredictable. And when you don't have when you haven't had an opportunity to express it, process it and understand it. That's the difference between a short term stressful experience versus a long term, potentially life altering, brain changing traumatic experience. So when you don't have an opportunity to express, process, and understand, that's the difference. And that's what makes it last throughout our lifetime. That's what makes our children, you know, continue to struggle after they've had traumatic experiences, whether that's adoption, whether it's foster care, whatever, when they haven't had an opportunity to express and process and understand, that's what that's what causes it to just carry over. So today I wanna to go a little bit deeper into our understanding of trauma. There are three kinds of trauma. And, and I, I want you to understand trauma and the, the, the kinds and the way it works because that's a part of, of just being able to conceptualize when you look at your children or when we as adoption providers, when we look at you or when we look at your children, I want us to have a framework. You have to have a working framework in your mind for what this child could be could be dealing with or, or coping with in any given moment. It's just like, it's not just a matter of paying attention, but it is an informed way of paying attention. So the attention that you are paying 
has has a, a parameter, a framework, an understanding behind it, and that makes a significant amount of difference. So there are three kinds of trauma. There's developmental trauma. This is what we're most familiar with in this field because these are these are the traumatic experiences that occur during childhood, including shock trauma. So it's it's any any real traumatic experience that occurs during childhood, meaning it occurs during the developmental stages is considered developmental trauma. So all of your children have experienced developmental trauma in some capacity. And what that means additionally is that when you have experienced a trauma in your early developmental stages, from that point forward, when you become stressed, you will regress to that developmental stage. And I talk a lot about the process of emotional regression, how we have the different stages. We have the cognitive stage, we have the chronological, we have the physical, and we have the emotional. Well, when you have, when you have a high level of stress, the emotional dictates to the cognitive, the chronological, and the physical. So it's the emotional age that's always important. So when you're talking about, about developmental trauma, you're talking about any traumatic experience that has occurred during your child's developmental stages, which then causes them, and adults as well, when under stress, to regress, to revert to that developmental stage. And then scientists call that the developmental stage of comfort, but it's really, the comfort is, is the experience up to the trauma. So then when you stress, you regress up to that developmental barrier and that's where you behave from. And then there's traumatic stress. That's the physical, the sexual, the emotional abuse, the neglect. That's you know any, any stressful event which tips the scale um, from being prolonged, overwhelming and unpredictable into that traumatic that traumatic area. And so all your children experience that. And then there is shock trauma. These, this is the immediate unavoidable experience of trauma. And so shock is a little bit different because of the way it, it causes the body to react. Shock trauma gets stored in the body in a freeze capacity. You, you're familiar with fight, flight, or freeze. Well, shock and, and all of our initial reactions is to freeze. Anytime we encounter a novel event, we freeze first and then we deem whether we're gonna fight or, or flee. With shock, your body goes into a freeze state. And when it goes into a freeze state, what happens is your nervous system actually starts trying to process the trauma energy. So people who are prone to shock, and this could be you know, a rape, it could be a child who is, um, in a fire, there's, there's a fire and, and a parent is lost in the fire. It could be, um, I always think about the, the lady from McDonald's years and years ago when I was a kid, there was a lady who got a cup of coffee, bought a cup of coffee at McDonald's, and then she spilled it on herself and she got like these, these third degree burns. So like these really intense burns and she sued McDonald's and got millions of dollars. But the reality is, the, the, the emotional psychological reality is that that has, has all the makings to have been shock trauma. Whereas any, any hot liquid from that point forward could cause her body to go into a free state and in that free state, render her helpless. I tell the story of a parent who was in one of my lectures in uh, Louisiana many years ago. And it was for a, a it was an addiction conference. And I was talking about trauma. And at the lunch, at the, at the break, she came up to me and she said, you will never believe what you just revealed to me. It's, it's something that I, have, I had never even thought of. And this was, you know, 40 something year old woman, 45 middle-aged woman. And she said, when I was a little girl, she said, I am terrified by birds. I'm terrified by birds. She said, I, I, do not like birds. She said, I will go. She said, the other day I went and I, I, I was going to work and I got into my car and I sit, got in my car, got ready to leave. And a bird flew down on the hood of my car. And she said, I froze. She said, I begged that bird, bird, please get off of my car. And she said, I could not move until that bird flew away. And when that bird flew away, I was able to pull out of my driveway 
and drive on to work. She said, hearing you talk about this trauma stuff just made me remember that when I was a little girl, about five or six years old, my sister and I were playing in the backyard and I got attacked by a chicken. She said, from that day forward, she said that chicken attacked us. And as she said, we told our dad and she, you know, I can't remember what dad did about it. But she said, from that day forward, I have been terrified by birds. That is a, an experience of shock. And so when people have experienced shock, what you will notice about them is they tend to literally freeze up. You ask them a question about something, they'll go silent. Their eyes may blink repetitively. They can't say anything. Sometimes they'll have an experience where they'll turn red and they'll start to sweat. I was in a session with a family once and I mentioned... I mentioned something about sex and I can't remember what it was that the mom and dad having sex or not having sex. And immediately the dad flushed. He had this smile on his face, which was, which was more of more a look of terror than it was joy. And he began to sweat profusely. That is a shock experience. Something in in my asking that question created shame, which triggered, which triggered his shock. So that's shock. So developmental trauma, traumatic stress and shock trauma. This is very, very important because your children and yourselves in some instances may have experienced any number, any, any one of these or all of them even together. So these are common traumatic events. These are the events that we're all familiar with. Abuse, neglect, adoption and foster care, frequent moves, chronic pain, emotional absence, parental depression, needs left unmet. And I've just, I've been talking about these for so many years that I don't go as into as much detail about them as I once did. But because we work in this field, because you have adopted children, because all of you have been through foster care training and had to be foster parents before you became adoptive parents, you're, you're familiar, you know, at a, at a kind of a layman's, layperson's level that these are pretty painful events. So you've got physical abuse and sexual abuse, you've got neglect, and then what we don't talk about a lot is emotional abuse, emotional abuse, and I'll always tie that in with emotional absence and parental depression. So we think of emotional abuse as, you know, someone, a parent yelling at their child and demeaning them and shaming them and putting them down and cussing them out and saying really hurtful things. And it's amazing how often you hear these things when you tune into them. Just the other day, I was in Walmart and some mom said something really, I mean, she, she said to like a a three-year-old, you better shut the F up. And I was like, golly, you know, it's just like, I just feel that energy. And so once you're tuned into these things, you just, you hear these kind of things more readily, but emotional abuse and emotional absence, they, they tie hand in hand. And the reason I, I do that is because both of them are experiences right along with parental depression. They're experiences that we don't talk a lot about in our society. And for probably 15 years, I have said that emotional absence, emotional abuse, parental depression are the most common forms of trauma in our society. And the reason for that is that you, they, they happen all the time. And so there, it's a constant experience just because of our social our social experience, just because of, of, of our culture, our society, and, and the experience of our society growing up and, and the things that we've, that we've all been through. But hang on just a minute. Where am I? Where am I doing? Okay, there. I'd like to stop this for just a moment. What we don't realize is that emotional absence and emotional abuse is the same and parental depression. They're all, they all tie in. I, I would say, I would say you, you wouldn't look at emotional abuse like emotional absence, but it has the same undertones. They all tie into stress communication. So Tiffany Fields is a, was a re, still is a researcher at the University of Miami, and she does a lot of infant infant research. So years ago, she did a research study. 
where she took two infants. She took a infant with a healthy parent and they hooked the infant up to brain scans. And then she took an infant with a depressed parent and, and they hooked that infant up to brain, brain scans. The scans looked exactly the same when the healthy parent got up and walked away from her baby in comparison to when the depressed parent walked towards her baby. So the scans looked exactly the same when the healthy parent got up and walked away versus when the, depre the, the depressed parent walked towards. Now think about that for a moment. If you're a healthy baby and your parent gets up and walks away, you're going to feel stressed because the parent is the source of soothing and is the, is the source of emotional support. Well, imagine if every time your parent walked towards you, you felt that same level of stress. That's the nonverbal communication of emotional absence and emotional abuse. This is why words can actually be more harmful than, actually, than even actions, because actions will end. Physical actions will end. Physical acts, physical experiences, they end. But words continue on and on and on. And, and I, I still hear words in my head, um, usually that my dad would say about my sister. You know, he, he'd call her a, a doofus or he'd call her, call her a, a, a gumpy. These are like really hurtful, shameful words. And I still hold those, those words in my mind because they were shaming. And we don't realize that these, the experience, the emotional experience is the, the least researched and is the least understood. And the reason is because you can't see it. It is a nonverbal vibratory experience. So the words you use with your children matter because those words carry a vibration. And parents, and, and so we think a lot about, so this, then I drop into emotional, I think about emotional absence. We think, well, I didn't have any trauma growing up, right? Most, you know, a lot of us will say, well, I, I had a pretty good life. Well, now think about this. If you, if you were, we always call the ideal scenario, obviously a two parent household. And in most scenarios, our parents had to work. Well, if you go back and you think about your childhood and you think about your parents who provided for you, they, they kept a roof over your head, they kept clothes on your body, they kept food on the table, they kept the basics going, you had a generally happy childhood. If you think about what your parents, what state were your parents in when they came home from work each day? Most of the time, they were exhausted. And so if you think about the instances and the times that you recall your parents setting you on their lap, your parents sitting down with you, looking at you and listening to you and talking to you and engaging with you and being present with you. You think about the times that you had um, moments of just really connected communication and time with your parents. Once you start to do that, you realize that that time became smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller as you got older. That, that time became shorter and shorter as you got older. And the significance there is that parents in our society who work every single day and have bills to pay and, and, and things to worry about, uh, laundry to do and food to put on the table and grew up the way they grew up, emotional absence is a pervasive experience in our society. We struggle with emotional connection and emotional presence. And so that is why I believe emotional absence is the most pervasive form of trauma in our society, the least understood and the least researched because you can't see it with the human eye. You can say, well, mom travels and she's off, she's off, she was off working all the time. Well, that, yeah, you can see that. But then you say, well, she comes back and when she came back home, it was always really great. And then you have to ask yourself emotionally, what was the implication of mom's absence 
while she was traveling all the time? And when she came home, how present was she when she was back home? So these are the things that we really have to look at when we start talking about the emotional experience that children have. And I think that this is probably the most pervasive one. And then I always say, obviously, adoption and foster care, two most co they're very common forms of trauma. I was doing a, a research, um, not a research, but I was doing a an interview in Australia once for NPR in Australia. And I had said that adoption is trauma and foster care is trauma. And the interviewer was like, well, why do you think these are, why would you say these are trauma? I mean, foster care is a very important thing. And I'm like, yeah, it's not foster care. It's that although trauma does ha happen in foster care far more than what it should. If you have a child who has been adopted or you have a child who has gone through foster care, you have a child who's already experienced trauma. So just to, just to know an adopted child has already experienced trauma, they've already experienced a significant loss. The, the, the greatest loss they will probably ever experience in their life. And usually it was pre-verbal, especially for, for younger children, you know, three, year, three years and younger, five years and younger, it's pre-verbal. So they don't even have words to put to the, to the anxiety and the, the, the experience of grief and what their body felt and what it still feels when they get overwhelmed and when they get really stressed because the, that early loss of that biological figure, I believe, is irreparable. I believe it is a lifetime, it is, it is a lifelong experience that will continually show up in the life of an adopted child. And the sooner we can begin with our children having, having conversations about it, processing it, allowing them to just think about it, planting the seeds in their lives about it, I think the more we are empowering our children as they get older to continue to have more consciousness about things that occur in their life that actually trigger those core experiences and those core events. And then frequent moves. moves is, moving is considered to be one of the top three most stressful experiences we ever encounter in life. Now that's for adults. Now, a lot of times we think it's just the move but it's not just the move. See, so much of this, you have to look under the surface. It's not just the move. It is the new smells, it is the new sights, it is the new sounds, it is the new energy of an environment. I am sensitive to energy in cities. And so if you think about that, if you think about, hang on just a moment, get distracted here, Lord, okay. If you think about that, when, you're, when you move, you have a, an entirely new sensory experience. And as adults, it is stressful because we have to make sense of things. You've got to learn, you got to learn where the Walmart is. You got to learn where the Safeway is. I'm thinking about what I, my most recent moving experience was to Crescent City. I got to learn where the Safeway is. I got to learn where the, where the computer repair store is. I got to learn where um, the drive to the ocean is. So you got to learn all these new things. And you've got to put all these things in your brain and you've got to store. These are all now memories and experiences getting stored. And then you've got to learn all these new faces and you've got to learn all these new energies in this new culture, in this new environment. And I'm an adult. Imagine for a child, not just for a child who moves to a new area with their family, okay, but now has to, now has to go to a new school now has to go to a new eye doctor, now has to go to a new grocery store, now has to go to a new playground. And this is, this is beyond any of the core experiences. Okay, now, now imagine if you're an infant, if you're an infant and your, your, first, your first experience in utero is all you know, it's, it's all you know, it is the totality. The in utero experience is the totality of all you know. It is life itself. You, you don't have words to it, but it is life experience, which is getting stored in your brainstem. Your brainstem is, is experiencing and storing every, every, in utero, every in utero experience that goes on. And so imagine then whether good or bad, and we know a lot of times it's not good. Imagine then you are born 
and you go into a incubator in a in a in a prenatal prenatal care center, um, or you go into a foster home, or you go into an orphanage, or you go um, onto the side the side of the road in a ditch, or you go and you're put on the steps somewhere, or you're in a dumpster. I mean, these are real life experiences that children have and that even some of us as adults have had. Well, you've got now a whole new experience that your brain is taking in that you don't know how to regulate. That's, that's moving. And then imagine every subsequent move after that. I mean, most, my most recent experience with moving um, children moving was a child who has, he's four years old and he is, was moving into his 12th placement at four years old. At four years old, his 12th placement. But I, I knew a child, he was a teenager when I met him, he had been in 77 different placements, 77 different placements by the time I got to meet him, which was at 13 years old. So you just think about all, there's no possible way. There's no possible way that any of us could be settled. And, and I, I used to want to film, do a film where you go into the middle of the night and you pull an adult out of their bed, out of their home, and you put them into the back of the car and you take them to this office. And then after you take them to this office, you take them to this, this other, this strange family's home and you drop them off with this bat, with this the storage glad bag full of their clothes. And you say, hey, this is your new home and this is your new mom and this is your new dad. Or take a, take a husband, pull him out of his home, put his clothes in a storage bag and drop him off at a home and say, hey, this is your new wife and this is your new kids. And see how an adult processes, processes that. We, we, we become so clueless when it comes to the impact of these traumatic experiences on the lives of our children because we don't slow down and think about them. We don't slow down and process them. And think about that. If we're not slowing down and thinking about them as parents, then we're not slowing down to honor and process the grief and the pain and the shock and the stress and the fear and the anger and the sadness that our children go through and have gone through in all these different experiences of their lives. And it's important because if the brain doesn't process, guess what? It stores the experience in a fragmented, incoherent way in the brain stem and in the body. And then anything can happen to trigger that experience which brings the body mind system to life. But Let's talk about this a little bit further. What do all these things have in common? See, this is the even bigger one. This is the even bigger one. What do all these things have in common? They all occur in the context of human relationships. All of these experiences occur in the context of human relationships. Now let's, what if you, what if you didn't adopt your child until he was five years old? You take his early life experience and every aspect of his early life experience is what has formed the framework for all of his future relationships and all of his future life experiences. So you take all of those experiences and they have formed a framework. Now imagine if he's experienced abuse. Imagine if he's experienced neglect. Imagine if he's been in three or four or five homes. Imagine if he's had to move. Imagine if he's been in pain and hasn't always been soothed. Because when you're in pain, your brain is pumping out cortisol. Imagine if he's the number of emotional emotionally absent adults he's interacted with. Imagine the parental depression he's been surrounded with. Imagine the times when he's been in pain and his needs were left unmet or when he was hungry or when he was sad or when he was scared or when he was cold or when he was hot or when it was dark and he was scared and he was all alone. Imagine the number of those experiences. They're creating the framework for how he sees the world, which means, now, if you think about it, why should he trust anyone? Why should he trust any adult? We had a child last year who, who had been through, been through a wraparound program. And at one point, we, so he went through the full 18 months. 
And at one point in the midst of the program, when I was talking to the mom, I helped her just come to the realization that this young man had been in care. He'd been in residential care or he had been in foster care or he had been in, in, in respite longer than he had been in his actual home. And he was 14 years old, 14 years old. So he was adopted when he was seven and he had been in more respite, more therapeutic placements and residential longer than he'd ever been in his home. So then what is his framework for relationships? What is his framework for parents? What is his framework for nurturing? It's almost non-existent. And guess what? Mom's ability to see that was like a light bulb experience for helping her change her expectations of where he should be and what he should do and how he should behave even though they went on to have huge breakthroughs in very short periods of time. And he's now been home. He's now been home longer than he's ever been, been in the family before. And they're, they're, he's doing exceptionally well. They're, the family's doing very well. I remember I went over to their house once and mom was telling me about a transition trauma that he had. Now think about this. This is, we don't think of, we don't think enough about transition traumas, transition. If, if you've, if you've, had abuse, if you've, if you've been neglected, if you've gone through adoption and foster care, if you've had frequent moves, then you probably have trauma in transitions. So any transition, Bruce Perry says, anytime you encounter a novel event, you perceive the brain perceives that event as a threat until deemed otherwise. So when you have had all of these core early experiences, anytime you encounter a novel event, your brain immediately goes into a state of freeze until it can no longer, until it can recognize that the experience is not a threat and it can relax. And so then you can then, you can then become flexible and move on through the experience. Well, I just walked over there and she said, you know what, I've been encountering this situation with him where I'll ask him to do something and he'll have this big kind of dramatic, oh my God, he'll, you know, his shoulders will slump and he feels so overwhelmed. And mom's, and as she's telling me this story, I'm, I'm standing in her, I'm standing in her kitchen. I, I still, I still see this in my brain. I'm sitting in her kitchen and she starts to get emotional. And she says, I, I realize, I realized that his transition struggles and challenges have always overwhelmed me. And that had I known, had I known that he wasn't being defiant, he wasn't being obstinate, he wasn't being willfully disobedient, that he wasn't disrespecting me. Had I known those things, had I known that he was just going through transition and that he has transition trauma, she said he probably never would have went into placement. And she, she was just, she just teared up. She just teared up the, the, the guilt she felt in that moment in, in not knowing, not understanding, not understanding. And then also the relief in now feeling empowered to be able to see him through these transitions and not even have to do anything about it. And, and look, I did a, I was doing post daily dose. A lot of you were following me on post daily dose. Um, I did, I did a uh, post daily dose once in Walmart. And I was talking about transition because I was there in Walmart and all of a sudden I realized, oh my gosh, it's daily dose time. And I was like, Ugh! and I just like went through this, this, ah, ah, this moment. Of, and it, it felt just like that. This moment of transition stress. And then I was went on and went and sat down and went and did it. Just this morning, I'm in Indiana with Tammy and Barry, two of my, my uh, team members. And I had my coffee this morning and was working on PowerPoint for today. And Tammy said, well, let's go over a few things. I was like, okay, let's do it. So I walk in, she pulls up a chair next to her laptop. And there's this other real comfy chair that looks so much more inviting. And so I passed the other chair and I went right to the comfy chair. And, 
And she said, are you going to, are you going to cause me to have to bring my laptop over there? And I said, no. I said, just start talking and then I'll come over. I had to transition. So I was still transitioning in my brain, but see, I'm aware of that. I'm more aware of that. And, and I'm, I'm 48 years old, 48 years old. And I still have transition challenges just for no, seemingly not threatening at all, not threatening at all. But that chair looked so much more comfortable and inviting. And I just had to sit in that chair for a moment. Now, what if Tammy had said, hey, you can't sit in that chair. You get up and sit in this chair right here. And I, I would have felt stressed. I would have felt overwhelmed. I would have felt offended. I would have felt defensive and I would have felt scared. And then I, even if I would have gotten up because I want to be respectful because my mama taught me right, I would have gotten up and I would have sat in that hard chair. And I, you know what I'd done? I wouldn't have paid any attention. I'd have just been sipping my little coffee like those Kermit Frog Mimis. And she'd have been talking. And then she'd have said, you're not listening. And then I would act, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'd act like I'm listening. And I'd have been sipping in my head, not paying any attention because I would have been stressed and I would have moved outside of my window of tolerance. And in that moment, all I could do is try to regulate myself. But she didn't do that. She gave me time to transition. I'm a grown man. And so think about just that transition trauma for your children, those moment to moment transition traumas. All right. Okay. So let's move on. Now these are unspoken traumatic events. Now see, these are these are these are traumatic events that we're familiar with. So you you get a foster child into your home, or or your child comes to you by way of of abuse or neglect or in utero exposure, and you're like, oh yeah, he's been through some he's been through some stuff. But these are events that we don't even think about. I mean, these are the ones that we're like. They're so, they're so out of our conscious, our conscious access. They're so outside of our day-to-day, -day, you know, short-term memory and engagement and, and awareness, medical traumas. You know, my, I have my 17-year-old daughter who has spina bifida, she's 17 years old and she has had not less than 23 surgeries throughout her life. But if you met her and you didn't know any, anything about those surgeries or anything about that life experience, you would judge her because she's overweight, because she's in a wheelchair, because she may not make be able to make the best eye contact with you because she's a little shy when she meets new people. You'd have a judgment and it could cause a stress reaction. And you could say, listen, kid, you need to pay attention. You need to, you need to listen to me. You need to look at me when I'm talking to you. So you make this judgment. You need to go on a diet. You make this judgment about who she is and have no conscious awareness of all the stress that she has gone through throughout the duration of her life. Yet she's an amazing child, amazing, smart, social, engaging. She just has to have her space to be able to be where she needs to be. Well, think about the children that come to your home who had surgeries right, right, right after they were born, or they they had fetal alcohol exposure, or they were in they were in uh, like my my sister, who my adopted sister, who was in an incubator for the first three months of her life because she was premature. These these are not experiences that just happen and then go away. You know, these are experiences that impact people the rest of their life. This these experiences change the brain. Trauma experiences change the brain. Bullying. How many children go to school and are bullied? Going to being bullied is is like having to face a monster every single day. One of our one of our respite parents has has an intense phobia around animals. She's terrified of animals, and we're going to be working on that soon. Help relieve her of that of that terror, of that stress, of that trauma. And I know it's connected to a trauma. So we just got to get in there. We got to dig in there. But she said, sometimes she can see a bird. And she said, in my, she said, I know it's a bird, but in my brain, it looks like a monster. 
Oh, that was such a it was such a big statement when she said that in my brain. She said, I know it's a bird, but in my brain, it looks like a monster. Oh, my goodness. Every time a child has to encounter a bully, they're in te- they're encountering a monster. How could a child even focus in school? How could they even learn? I mean, that is really the resilience of the brain is the ability to, to deal with bullying and still go to school every day. I mean, some ki- I can't I c- couldn't blame a kid for not wanting to go to school. Car accidents. I worked with a girl when she was 13. Her grandmother was raising her who always had transition trauma, transition challenges with getting in the car. Well, guess what? When she was an infant, she was driving along. She was in the back seat and she was in a car- in a carrier with her mom and dad. Something happened. Her dad was decapitated, decapitated as an infant, as an infant. And her mother was killed. She lost both her parents in a car accident. Do you think she would ever her physically, now you would think, well, she was a baby. How could she possibly remember? Your brain stem stores everything. It stores everything. So the shock of that experience, and that was a significant trauma. That was a shock trauma. Got stored in her body mind system as a fetus. And every time her grandma tried to get her to get in the car, it didn't matter if it was going to school or going to McDonald's. It was a problem. My my adopted son, he used when I, when he first came to live with us in, in the group home, which was in Virginia, he was 15 years old. And between 15 and 18, probably he's about 15 to 17, he would, he would, first he would dilly and dally, right? So, you know, he'd just lollygag along when it was time to go somewhere. It would just take so everyone would be in in the truck waiting for him. And of course, these are all, this was an adolescent group home with adolescent boys, six adolescent boys that all be in the truck waiting for him. And he would lollygag along. So we've made, made adjustments, made adjustments. And then finally, one day I said to him, Kevin, because then what he would do is he would, he would almost pack up half his bedroom. He'd pack up half his, like we'd be going to Walmart and he'd need to bring his stereo. He would need to bring his backpack full of whatever crap he had. He was a hoarder at that time. And he would need to put it all in the truck. And finally I said to him, Kevin, when, when we leave, you can bring one thing. And I promise you, we are going to come back. We will be back. And if you need to call the house and listen to a voice message, we can do that, but we will be back. And that is when he finally, he moved through the lollygagging, but he always had to bring something. He always had to bring something. Some of you got to meet Kevin, you know, Kevin, ask him, ask him, he'll tell you, he pack up the whole back of the suburban. And I would be sitting there going, Oh my God. If like for an overnight across town, he take everything. So, you know, that's, an, that's another, and that's because of his early experience with transition and with moving and, and losing things and, and not having a stable, consistent environment and not trusting that what he has today is going to be there tomorrow. So we take these things for granted. Then the, the chronic illness, the childhood spills, the childhood incidents, work accidents, many, many more. These are all unspoken traumatic events in our lives. Now, in the first session, I talked about this, but I, I want to I want to go back to it because it's so important. Because we can actually say, well, I haven't had any of these things. I haven't had any of these experiences in my life. I, I haven't experienced any trauma. Stress research says that trauma can be passed down through the DNA for up to seven to nine years. Trauma can still be found in the DNA. This is the generational transmission of trauma. The Bible said the sins of the forefathers will be visited upon the third and fourth generations or fourth and fifth, or fifth and sixth. I I haven't refreshed my Bible memory recently. But the Bible says the sins of the forefathers will be visited upon, I think it's the third and fourth generation. 
And that's talking about the generational transmission of trauma. But research now says that traumas can show up in the DNA. And they actually did this research with earthworms. And this is actually new. This only came out just, just two, three years ago because we're doing so much human genome sequencing and, and we're able to look so much deeper into the DNA now than we have ever before. Seven to nine years a trauma experience can still show up, can still be, can still be being carried down and, and passed along. Now, you haven't had any trauma in your experience in your lifetime. Your child has, okay? That's a granted. But let me ask you something. What was your mom and dad's experience as children? What's their life experience been? Oh, oh, what was grandma and grandpa's life experience? Like some of you, some of you, if you start to really look at it, you go back and you had an adoptive, an adopted grandparent and don't even realize it. You had a grandparent that was grew up in an orphanage and didn't even realize it. Or a great grandparent who grew up by themselves, who raised themselves. There's significant loss. See, this this trauma thing is is visited upon all of us. And we have to understand it because. It impacts our brain. It impacts our sensitivity to stress. It impacts our overwhelm. So you think about the way these, these generations pass down these traumas and you, you understand these traumas so you can understand your own sensitivity, understand your own overwhelm, understand, understand your own challenges. My, my mother and father, my adopted mom and dad that raised me, who I consider my mom and dad, they had alcoholism. My dad's, my mom's dad had a heart attack in front of her when she was nine years old. My dad's dad was shot and killed in a bar. Um, both, both of their parents grew up as, as children of sharecroppers. And then before them, the, before that was slavery, the trauma of slavery. And, and that, was, that was an atrocity. So that wasn't something as simple as losing a parent. That was a, a, a near decimation of a whole race of people. Same for the Jewish people, same for the Indian people. That trauma is not that far away. It's not that far away from our physiology. It's still very much active and alive and it's there. Now, now think about this. So that's my, th those, are the, those are the parents that raised me. My biological parents, when my biological mother was eight years old, she was in the bedroom when her dad came in, came in the house where they were and murdered her mother. She and her five or six siblings. Her dad came in in the morning and murdered her mother. I can't remember if he, if he stabbed her to death or if he shot her. She told me the story. They were in the bedroom hiding. That's my biological mom my biological mother, my biological father, when he was 14 years old, my grandfather fell seven stories off of a building. My, my great, great grandfather was a brick washer. He was an entrepreneur and he was a brick washer in, in Washington, DC. And my grandfather was working for him and he fell five stories and, and died. And shortly after that, my dad, because that's obviously traumatic, you're 13 years, 14 years old, you're in your formative stages. He said he really started getting into the streets and his mom didn't know what to do with him. So she sent him to a boy's home. He was in that boy's home until he was 16, 17 years old. When he got out of that boy's home, his mom had moved from Washington. His mom, my grandmother, had moved from Washington, D.C. to Muskogee, Oklahoma. So when people say, we're, we're ask me where I'm from, I'm from Oklahoma. I am literally an Okie from Muskogee. So if you ever heard that, that country, that country Western song, that's your research. <laughs> your homework assignment today is to listen to uh, uh, Merle Haggard, Okie from Muskogee. I'm an Okie from Muskogee. That's how I got to Muskogee, Oklahoma. When my dad was 16 or 17 years old, he got out of that boy's home and he rode his motorcycle. I love motorcycles to this day. Rode his motorcycle to Muskogee, Oklahoma. And that's where he eventually met my mom. But can you imagine just that alone? 
number one, losing your dad, number two, now losing your mom because you've been sent to a boy's home, and number three, the community that you were raised in, all your friends, all the people you knew when you, now you're 16, 17 years old, all of that's now gone away, and you end up from Washington, D.C. to Muskogee, Oklahoma. Oklahoma is, is country as it is. You know, Muskogee is country country. It's like boondock Country, country, it's almost hillbilly country. In Oklahoma, you got rednecks. I always call myself a black redneck. In Oklahoma, you got rednecks. In Arkansas, you have hillbillies. Muskogee's almost hillbilly country. I, you know, I always say rednecks are a little bit higher class than hillbillies. But anyway, generational transmission of trauma. I want you to map out that. Think about that trauma for your parents. Last session, we talked about grieving, grieving some of those traumas, but I want you to map out some of those experiences. And if you don't know, ask. If you don't know about your birth history, if you have the possibility, if you're still fortunate to have a parent around, ask about your birth. Ask where mom and dad lived. Ask how their relationship was. Ask what the, what the environment was during that day and time. Kid, children born now, children born in today's society, they are born into a traumatic society. The pandemic, adults wearing masks, you know, the politics out of control. It's just like everything is so stressed. Their lives are going to be vastly different. Their brains are going to be vastly different than our brains that we grew up in. And we grew up in environments of trauma. So just think about those things because it all goes into your stress sensitivity. Okay, let me see where we're at here. Quick refresh on the brain. You got you have your amygdala, fight, flight, or freeze. Fight, flight, or freeze. Freeze is always the initial reaction anytime you encounter a threatening event, and then you determine whether you're going to fight or you're going to flee. And then you have your cortisol, which hits your pituitary, which then passes your hypothalamus, and that's where your oxytocin response is supposed to turn on. Your oxytocin response is your brain's anti-stress hormone. I want you guys to remember these things. I want you to commit it to memory. I want you to study it. I want you to see, I'm not making this real complicated. I'm making this really simple. This, this, I am sharing with you my reality for the last 20 years of how I see stress and children and human behavior. It, it doesn't have to get any more complicated than this. And after, after session four, I had a mom text me and she said, well, what about this specific situation? And it was a situation where the kids trying not, you know, taking all their stuff and they, they're scattering, scattering it all over their house, right? And so she's like completely overwhelmed because then they don't want to clean up. So then she sends me pictures. She sent me a video. And so I look at it and the first thing, so the first thing I see, so if you look at, if you look at a, real, a house strung full of toys and kids obviously having a fantastic time, the, the first thing as a parent we want to do is we want to get overwhelmed. We want to get overwhelmed. And the moment we become overwhelmed, our amygdala is releasing cortisol, which is overwhelming our hypothalamus and our oxytocin response. So we're not calming down. And it's overwhelming our hippocampus. Your hippocampus, mood, memory, and learning. Your hippocampus, mood, memory, and learning. I want you to remember those three things. Mood, memory, and learning. When your amygdala is pumping out overwhelming amounts of cortisol, guess what's going to be affected? Mood, memory, and learning. Because your hippocampus is going to be overwhelmed. Mood, memory, and learning. So all of a sudden, your message from your hippocampus to your orbital frontal cortex, which is your prefrontal cortex, your orbital frontal cortex is the executive control center for all of your social and emotional relationships. The executive control center for all your social and emotional relationships. But it receives its signals from the hippocampus, from that communication. So if you're overwhelmed, if your amygdala is overwhelmed, if you're stressed, and that's why I always reference Joseph Ledeau, in times of stress, our thinking becomes confused and distorted and our short-term memory is suppressed. When we are stressed out, and it's not even, have, you don't even have to be stressed out, just stress. Just having a communication. Remember, I was just sitting here talking to Tammy earlier and she's like, I'm, I'm having a brain fart right now. Or, I'm having a brain something right now. And it's because in that moment, in that moment, in a non-threatening, ultimately non-stressful environment, she's working hard to remember something. And if she just relaxed just a moment and then it just, it just popped right back up. Right. We do that. We can be having a conversation and you say, do you remember, do you remember that guy? What was his name? What? Oh my gosh. I can't remember. His 
All you got to do is take a deep breath. Take a deep breath, wait, and it'll pop up. Because in times of stress, your thinking becomes confused and distorted and your short-term memory is shut off. In times of stress, your thinking becomes confused and distorted and your short-term memory is shut off. So you have to work really hard to remember to breathe when you're stressed because that's how you keep that cortisol dialed down. You keep that oxytocin turned up. You turn up that oxytocin to dial down that cortisol so you can keep your, your mood, your memory, and your learning open and communicating to your prefrontal cortex. If you are stressed, your mood, memory, and learning are all going to be impacted. So if you look at, if your children have all their toys strewn all over the house, the first thing you do is you get stressed and overwhelmed. The second, you, the second thing you do is you reach out to me. Why? Because that's what I want you to do. I want you to reach out to your coach. I want you to reach out to me because that's what our role as RAP providers are. Our role is to be a support to you. So if you're stressed and you can't create oxytocin for yourself, then you reach out for support. You reach out for help. It's the same thing your kids are supposed to do with you. When you your kids are stressed, they're supposed to be able to reach back to you. And what do you do? You provide them oxytocin support. You provide them regulation. You're supposed to do that for us, with us as rat providers. You reach back to us. We're supposed to provide you support. We provide you support. We help turn on your oxytocin. We help you get calm. We help all of a sudden your mood, memory, and learning improve. And then I look at the video instead of me getting overwhelmed because I could have said, oh my gosh, that house is terrible. You should do it. You got to get those kids in order. Then I'd have been creating more stress for the parent. But I didn't. I looked at the video and I said, there's too many toys. There's too many toys. Reduce the toys. And she said, I already boxed up. I already boxed up a whole bunch of them. Fancy, she already done that. That's the first thing we have to do. Let's just reduce the chaos and then introduce them at another time. And all of a sudden your kids think they're new toys again. But even bigger than that, because I know the family, because I know the home, they're in a new home. It's a new environment. Big, big, big. This is a particular family who went through the, lost their home in the paradise fires. So had to move to another home. And then that, that home was stressful because it, the, the sewage next to the orchards didn't work. And then they had to move to another home. So now they're, they're in another home. So there, you know, all these transition, all these transition stressors, these new moves, all these things going on, kids are, pro, are, are bound, they are bound to be regressed. They're bound to be more like toddlers that want to play with everything. But more than that, I know now I, I know both homes because I've been in both homes. And I said to mom, hey, in the last home, they had a great big room. That was all theirs. They got to, they got to string their toys out everywhere. They don't have that room. They don't have that same big room anymore. They just have their little bedrooms. So guess what they're doing? They're stringing their toys out. It's conditioning. The brain is conditioned. What do we have to do? We have to not get overwhelmed. We reduce the toys. We, we reduce repetition. We reduce the toys. There's less to be strewn around. You give them an area where they can play. You give them an area where they can play and you continually through repetition because this is about changing the brain. Through repetition, you bring them back to that area. That's the limits. You bring them back to that area. Sometimes you got to get firm. Mom says, well, I don't want to be mean. You're not, it's not about being mean. Sometimes you got to get firm. Hey, we're going to clean this up and hey, we're going to stay right in here and you got to be firm and you got to keep doing it. And sometimes their feelings might get hurt and they might cry and they might say, you're mean mommy, you're mean mommy. And that's okay because they are entitled to their attitudes and their feelings. And that's a whole nother thing we're going to get into at another session coming up soon. So there we have it. Where are we at next? Oh, two important terms. I'm going to pick up on this. Next week, as we move into the three pathways of emotional expression, remember the stress model. So we got regulation and dysregulation. Regulation is the experience of stress within your window of tolerance. Dysregulation is the experience of stress outside of your window of tolerance. Very, very, very important. When you are stressed out, your thinking is offline. Your mood, your memory, and your learning completely offline. Taylor et al. 1997 in Alan Shore's classic, classic volume one of his, his, his trilogy, Affect Regulation and the Origin of the Self. He quotes Taylor et al. as saying, it is believed 
that affect dysregulation is a fundamental mechanism involved in all psychiatric disorders. It is believed that being stressed out is the fundamental cause of all psychiatric problems, psychological, emotional, behavioral, physical, it's all stress. It's all stress. And we'll get into that in our next session. And just let me give you a real quick review of the stress model. I want you to commit this to memory. All behavior arises from a state of stress. In between the behavior and the stress is the presence of a primary emotion. There are only two primary emotions, love and fear. It is through the expression, the processing, and the understanding of the fear that we calm the stress and diminish the behavior. And in every possible moment, we want to be able to reflect on our own stress and our own fear, calm that first, and then lead the way for our children. And that brings us to the end of session number five. Thank you guys for joining me. I love you so much. God bless each and every one of you. Remember in any given situation, we always have two choices. We can continue to react from the same blueprints and experiences of stress and fear and overwhelm, or we can stop, we can slow down, take three to 10 deep breaths, and choose love. And I want you to choose love. And I look forward to seeing you on the next session. Talk to you later.